Absolutely. And that's by request. And how do you propose we do that? Well, whether I win or lose this election, I promise you, Harriet, I'm going to take your information at the end of this event, and I will help you any way that I can to get that spot. Because, again, both of my parents live in the district. They're both seniors. Uh, they live right next door to me. Uh, they're luckily in pretty good health, but that could change very quickly in the future, so I understand this, number one. Number two, we know, again, having grown up here, we know that the main users of our public libraries are children and seniors. And that's about 90% of the people who use it on a regular basis. <laughs> Unfortunately, now, now let's put it this way, in order to get the bus stop changed, that takes DOT, MTA, all of the agencies, etc. I'm certainly willing to advocate for you to do that. As I said, whether, whether I'm elected councilman or not, because that's my role as a community activist and advocate. That's what I've been doing. Thank that's, you. That's number one. Unfortunately, a similar situation was put in jeopardy by my opponent two years ago. The McGoldrick branch, do you know where the McGoldrick branch is? That's on Northern Boulevard and 156th Street in the Broadway Flushing neighborhood. There was a proposal to close, this is right where Roosevelt Avenue ends at Northern Boulevard from downtown Flushing, to close that road and turn it into a pedestrian plaza. Okay? Which, for actually, not only a pedestrian plaza, but to also be used by a Korean barbecue restaurant for outdoor seating, which had taken over the McDonald's, which was right next to it. The community was outraged, A, because of the seniors, B, because of the traffic snarl that was going to be created by that. But the bigger issue was the seniors. The seniors were going to be impacted because there was going to be no place within a short walk to get to the front door. And again, my opponent supported closing that street to a pedestrian plaza, and luckily it was never implemented. So this is, again, where someone who is a community leader who actually understands why something should happen or shouldn't happen should be your representative versus someone who talks a lot and talks a very good game, but ultimately was listed as the 38th best council person two months ago, 38 out of 51, last in constituent response and last in enacted legislation. Thank you. Thank you. Somewhere in there was a question about a bus stop, I think. So yes, those are the good ideas. What you have to do is get the merger and the permission to put two or three bus stops together. Um, the other better news with the Bay Terrace Library is $5 million for a brand new renovated Bay Terrace Library that's starting this spring and a new park next door to it. That works because Melinda Katz and I were able to team up and that was the first library. Bay Terrace was the first library we worked on because so many of the great programs and resources for our seniors and our students are at that library. And it's so utilized, parking becomes a major problem. The other thing you need to do is work with your neighbors. So Ford Meyer has the parking lot with the Bay Terrace Shopping Center they're willing to work out some additional parking spots for use for the library. So wor idea. working with That's those folks uh, and, and working with Court Myers is always important because the landlord, you know, so for your fellow co-op owners, we just successfully negotiated the deed transfer to the uh, co-op sections one through, now in the future, through one through 12. That's going to be permanent legacy for all of Bayside. That's how you work together, by actually getting it done. Not by talking nonsense, by actually getting it done. That's the important stuff one have to do. And by the way, when somebody proposes an idea, it's so simple to say no, because that's all everyone wants. No, we're not gonna do it. I don't wanna do this. Because there's always gonna be anger and frustration. When you feed that anger, you create chaos for no reason. You talk to everyone, and whatever the ultimate decision is, you follow it. Whether it's a plaza, whether it's a school, whether it's Bay Terrace here, you talk about it. No one ever had access and the ability to talk to city agencies and talk about that. That's what we thought. So thank you. So your next question is Yes, hi, good evening. Uh, this is for both candidates. There's a proposal one calling for a state constitutional convention. Yes. So I want to hear from both candidates the pros and cons. Do you agree and disagree? 
And number two, I think you are both aware that there is now a homeless situation in Fort Totten. Yes. Where for, yes. The 109 actually spoke to you last month. Well, I wasn't here, but okay. I did see the person, the woman that's... Um, there's a woman and a man. That's right. There. And what it is is that she just fell upon hard times and she refuses to go to a shelter. However, you know, one attracts another. And since there are people that walk there, I just want to know what your position is on that. Well, the safety issue. larger issue is why there's so many homeless. Um, when we had the meeting last month, the 109 actually goes on a daily basis. They know both of their names. Right. They talk about the programs that are available, but both decide to go back. If someone's not breaking the law, you can't force them, you can't put them in jail. So the, the ability now with that um, bathroom that's been renovated right. Right. creates an, a, a, almost like it's a, an attraction. Come on home, come right. on over. Exactly. So it, it's not a matter of we don't want homeless here because that's not the type of community we are. It's what can we do to make that those lives better so we can address it and get them the help that they need. Um, a lot of the nonprofits around here, like my parish, St. Andrew Avellino, or the Korean parishes, have homeless shelters voluntarily. The problem is when Bloomberg left office, he canceled the program where they reimbursed the fuel costs and the food costs. If you really want to tackle homelessness, support the groups that are actually bringing in the parishes and the places of worship. Get them some reimbursement for it so we can get them off the street and get them into the property. I know, but, but with Proposition Malone, 1. But you know, there is an issue now that the homeless are being sheltered into these hotels, which is costing the yes, taxpayers but, but a lot of money. We and the mayor refuses to, to acknowledge the, the situation with the homeless. It's a very big situation. But thankfully, but right. that is where the mayor has right. failed. And I would love to tell you why he's failed and how to get there. When you open the doors to government subsidies and people become dependent on those subsidies, it creates a a dependency on the government system, not an ability to move past the system, get a job, get an apartment. He opened the floodgates with that, and as a result, we've had four years of increased homelessness in the best economy that we've had. It's, it's, more, prevalent, it really, it's more prevalent now. It really now. doesn't make up. Now back to first thing with Proposition right. 1, because you won't have a chance but, to vote. Right. Proposition 1 is the ability to open up the state, cons the state oh, right. constitution and the convention. Oh, We're opposed oh. to that, because I do not like giving unbridled power to the government without a list of what you're going to do. If you're going, exactly. If you're just going to open up the Constitutional Convention and say, I can do anything I want and not tell you about it, that's everything that gets people upset with politics. We want disclosure. What are you going to do? Put the bullets, when we, if we do get the power to open, this is what we want to look at. A, B, C, D, and E. We don't have any of that. So there's a lot of fear out there. There's a lot of folks on unions with pension benefits saying, hey, we've, we've contributed our whole lives to this. Are you going to now take this away or reduce it without our input? What's going on with, with the constitutional steps there? There's no protection. So I'm opposed to it because the lawyer side of me says, no, 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 no. You don't want to give unbridled power to anyone without knowing what you're going to do. It should be, we are going into the Constitutional Convention to do this, this, and this. And we'd like to have the permission to do that. Do you agree? It's not that at all. So that's why we're opposed to the motion. Well, I'm glad my opponent mentioned that he's opposed to the Constitutional Convention because last Thursday night, we had another candidate's night at the Bayside Historical Society. Almost 100 people showed up. And part B of that candidate's night was about the Constitutional Convention. And my opponent did not show up to that candidate's night either. So it's great that he showed up to the Bay Club. I guess he's concerned about your vote since I actually won this ED in the primary. But basically, uh, what I'm concerned about is that we actually agree on something. We're both opposed to the Constitutional Convention. The Constitutional Convention, most of what can be done in the Constitutional Convention can be done by the legislature. <clears throat> so it just takes an act of the legislature, it has to pass two sessions and then it has to be signed by the governor. And then it goes to referendum. Then the, then the people decide, once that question is on, whether it's yay or nay about a particular issue. So there already is a process to do that. And I believe, you know, I, I actually listen to people talk about the Constitution, who are in favor of the Constitutional Convention. They're saying, great things were done in the 1840s. Okay, well we're in 2017 and lobbyists control the entire uh, political discussion about many, many issues. The things that I'm concerned about, which are labor protections, protections about rent control and rent stabilization and other things, which again, lobbying firms like Constantinople and Vallone 
are trying to kill in some cases. That's why we shouldn't have a constitutional convention. It's very important not to do it because, again, whatever could happen could be done through the legislature. Uh, part A of your question, Miss. I'm sorry, part, part B. Yes, so <clears throat> part of the problem actually has to do with something called ZQA MIH. This was passed, it's Zoning for Quality and Affordability and Mandatory Inclusionary Housing. This was a very big issue two and a half years ago. The mayor rolled this out through the City Planning Commission. And I was actually one of the leaders trying to stop this because it's a terrible program. I actually went to, out of the 50 plus community boards in the city, I actually spoke at 37 of them personally. And I met with various council members as well, meeting with civic associations, etc. The problem with this process, and the, the, the reason we have increased homelessness in this city, is because of out of control real estate development, which is spurring on higher and higher prices. And it's pricing out people, and neighborhoods are gentrifying at a remarkable rate. So you have places like East New York, and other very poor neighborhoods that were receptacles of poor people, and, and again, throughout Brooklyn, throughout Queens, throughout the Bronx, particularly, and in northern Manhattan, were working class people, working people, real, not, not people with problems, because there's different types of homeless people, at, you know, just like there's different types of people here, but people who are now hard on their luck, like you said, because they've lost their home. They lost the place they were living for 20 years because the real estate prices have skyrocketed so much that gentrification is pushing them out. And ZQA MIH is also pushing them out because what Mayor de Blasio did, again, while my opponent voted against ZQA, he did vote in favor of MIH, was by creating this process where anytime a neighborhood is rezoned they have to include affordable housing. It's sort of a red herring. Because what it's really doing is rezoning a neighborhood for 80% luxury condominiums or luxury apartments and 20% affordable. So whatever is made up in that affordable portion is outweighed tremendously by the market forces marching through that area. So the best way to approach this is actually to create zoning. We have what's called as of right zoning. Okay, so what does this mean? If you're zoned a particular zone, you're R6 or R7, you've got this piece of property, this is what you can build there. You can build an 80 unit building, you can build a 100 unit building, whatever. The most important thing is to rewrite the law to make it so that all new developers in high density districts must include affordable housing as of right, not as an inducement to build higher and more. This is what's going on under the current regime. So in Northeast Queens, we have about 40 to 50 families that are homeless. It's actually a very small number, as opposed to a place like Crown Heights, where there are 6,000 families that are homeless or near homeless. We need to be putting the services where they deserve in places like Crown Heights and other neighborhoods that have high amounts of homelessness. In places like Northeast Queens, Again, unfortunately, or fortunately at this point, I do agree with my opponent that when Mayor Bloomberg left office, he killed all of the private social service agencies, many of faith, but some not of faith, and instead flipped all of this to consultants and large-scale uh, uh, providers like Samaritan Village and giving them giant contracts for these hotels, which I have been protesting at for the last two years. The one in Maspeth, the one on Queens Boulevard, the Pan Am, which are just awful. And it's terrible for the families who are there, and it's terrible for the community. This is not the way to approach the homeless situation. The best way to approach someone like this is to create supportive housing for the people in our district who are homeless, which again is probably between 40 and 50 families in total. That's the best way to start, and to do that would be, again, to re-include the faith-based organizations that were doing a great job providing temporary housing, safe temporary housing for those folks. So I hope that answers your question.
Sure. <clears throat> Mr. Lair, what can I do? Uh, this is addressed to uh, both Pauls. <clears throat> Uh, by the way, I'm Arthur Lehrer. I live in the East Building. This is an issue related strictly to the Bay Club safety. You've heard about this many times in the past, especially Paul Vallone, in that you take your life in your hands when you're trying to leave the Bay Club by car and want to make a right turn or even if you want to make a left turn, the visibility is blocked from the right because of a truck or a delivery vehicle that's there. I'm proposing, and I'm sure you've heard this before, I try not to roll your eyes, uh, a stop sign at the uh, at Bay Club uh, entrance. Uh, for the reason I just described, but for another very important, improbable reason, but it could happen. We have 1,100 apartments, maybe 1,000 cars parked here. Cars are coming in and out every hour. If there is an emergency where we have to evacuate, the Bay Club, unlike many other large developments, has only one entrance, one egress. And that's through the one entrance and egress we have. And if a thousand cars are trying to get out, and we have traffic streaming up and down 23rd Avenue, it could be a disaster. So we need a, a, a stop sign. North Shore Towers has not a stop sign. They have a traffic light. And their crossing street, unlike 23rd Avenue, has practically no traffic. But yet, they have a, a traffic light. So I propose, and I will continue to propose for as long as any of you are in office, to try and uh, have a stop sign at the entrance uh, of the Bay Club. I know it is not, you are not the final uh, arbiter on this, but I'm asking you to continue to promote and campaign for it. Oh, I wanted to point out, right, yes. my wife reminded me. We took a drive from the Bay Club to Northern Boulevard along Corporal Kennedy. You know how many stop signs and traffic lights there are in total in that short trip? 16 yep. stop signs and traffic lights between here and Northern Boulevard. Yeah, 16 stop signs out of 16 or 17 blocks. I mean, I've included red lights. Yeah, it's almost every block. Yeah. yeah. So that should be a clue of uh, what should well, be done here. And I guess I've talked enough. I, I, you were very thorough, and I appreciate that. Um, the first thing I'll say is uh, I support having that here. I, I support whether it's a stop sign or a light, I think a stop sign is actually better. I agree with that. And I'll tell you why. Where I live, which is the cor near the corner of 146th Street and 32nd Avenue in Flushing, growing up, there was a light at Union Street, a light one block after at Parsons Boulevard, and a light at 149th Street. So between Parsons and 149th Street is actually only three blocks, but it's almost a quarter of a mile. The, the blocks are extremely long. And so from Parsons, people would be driving 50, 60 miles an hour on my street to get to 149th Street before the light would change. So starting in the 90s, after multiple, multiple accidents occurred by my corner, I started advocating for a four-way stop. And it took, it took the death of a kid for it to finally happen, because the DOT 
believe it or not, they're that morbid. They will say to you, well, there haven't been enough fatalities or accidents for it to justify that kind of response. Now, again, the DOT works for the mayor. They're the agency, uh, let me change that. The mayor controls the DOT. All the agencies are controlled by the mayor. The mayor is supposed to work for us, just like the council member is supposed to work for us. I can promise you that I would advocate for that because again, my, my own family, I'm one house off of the block, off of the corner, had three cars totaled within the span of a year and a half because of people speeding on that stretch. Once the four-way stop went in, which is now going close, close to 20 years, there has not been a single accident at my corner, not one. So I, I'm all about people being able to get from place A to place B, but it has to be safe. And in your case, not only do you have a thousand cars here, but the vast majority of the folks who are here are also seniors. And many have emergency situations where they have to leave very quickly. So it's, it's my opinion that, yes, I would support that 100% and I would do everything I can. And again, same response to Harriet, I'll help you regardless of whether I get elected or not, because that's what I do. So, thank you. So the Corporal Kennedy 212-26-23rd Avenue, that was really, again, one of the first things that everyone kind of talked about is how can we make that stretch safer? Uh, and that was one of the first things we championed for you. So the traffic study was done from the front all the way up to 26th Avenue, and it was approved for safety enhancements, which are going to start this spring. So they're going to extend the sidewalks, extend the markings, slow down the traffic, put some flashing lights at the, the bends and the strip. The problem is also going past 169 Bell Academy all the way up to Bell Boulevard, they haven't looked at. And there's not one safe way to cross either for all of my co-op owners to get back and forth. Uh, and as the area grows and more and more people, it's going to become even more of an issue. So believe it or not, the light is not a clear-cut issue. If you were to talk to 50 people on this side and 50 people on that side,